This is an awesome Sunday morning. Three people agree with me. <laughs> All right, I got some questions for you this morning. We're going to continue on this line of trying to make you feel uncomfortable because that's when you're growing. If you haven't heard that statement before, when you are comfortable, you are not growing. That is a fact. I mean, maybe if you're like comfortable eating cheeseburgers, you're growing. But I'm talking about mentally, emotionally, spiritually. If you're comfortable, you're not growing. So when we ask you to get uncomfortable, we're not asking you to get embarrassed, humiliated. We're asking you to grow, okay? All right. So here's some questions this morning. How many of you are ready to see a large revival in the American church? Okay. What about the world? I don't really know what churches look like around the world, I'm, I, but what, are you ready to see a revival in the whole world? Okay. How many of you are ready to see a flood of the Holy Spirit come into this place so thick that when people walk in here, they just kind of lay out on the floor? You want to see that? Do you want to feel it? Okay. How many of you want to see a movement come across East Tennessee that's so big? You know, we, we went and saw Sean Foyt last year. Remember Sean Foyt? And he brings in a crowd of 50,000 on the National Mall in D.C., and he's going all over. How many of you want to see a move like that come to East Tennessee where thousands and thousands get together and worship God, and people are brought to the Lord, and stuff's broken off of people like rejection and sickness, and people are baptized? How many of you want to see that? Thousands, Okay. How many of you want to see a dead person raised from the dead? I want to see that. How many of you want to see this church outgrow this chapel and grow into a big, large building so we can reach our community better? Well, nobody got excited about that one. What happened? Man. We might change directions this morning. <laughs> How many of you are looking for somebody rich to walk in the door and write us a million dollar check so we can pay off all of our debt? We don't have to do weddings anymore. We can 100% focus on church. How many of you are ready for that? So what are all those things I just talked about? Every one of those things were big things, right? Big things. We're supposed to expect big things. We want to ask God for big things that are exciting things to think about, to hope for, to pray for. You with me? All right, I'm going to change my questions a little bit. How many of you get just as excited, I said just as excited, that a father would make an effort or a mother would make an effort not to talk down to their kids anymore like they have for years? Wait, why didn't everybody get just as excited? Thank you. How many of you would get just as excited knowing that someone who's held a grudge for years let that grudge go? How many of you, kind of along the same lines, would get just as excited to know that someone who's held on to unforgiveness for many, many years towards someone who's hurt them, that they've just decided to let that unforgiveness go? Would you get just as excited about that? How many of you would get just as excited to know that your friend gave up on pride and got on their knees and cried out to God? Would you get just as excited for that? Okay. How many of you would get just as excited to see one new face come through these doors on Sunday morning versus a thousand new faces in a big building? How many of you get just as excited to praise Jesus to the top of your lungs while you're driving to work in your car as you would for 50,000 people coming to East Tennessee? Okay. <laughs> How many of you would get just as excited? Man, this is in my notes, but it happened this morning. How many of you would get just as excited when one little life is given to Jesus? Okay. How many of you would get just as excited to find out your, spou your spouse, your child, your parent has finally won their battle with anxiety, depression, etc.? How many of you are praying for a miracle in your finances or your health or for your child 
and you get just as excited to find out maybe a third of what you prayed for came true. So what's my point? My point was that first list was big things. They were good things, but they were big things, right? They're all great, but my concern is that we get so wrapped up in looking for the big things that we forget about the little things. We get so wrapped up in looking for the big things we want God to do, we expect him to do, that we totally lose sight of the little things going on right around us, as well as our opportunity to do little things around us, okay? See, when we want these big things, and I want these big things, I want every one of those things we just talked about, but if I get so wrapped up in those big things, then over time, when I don't see them, what happens? We get complacent. We get comfortable. Thank you, Wiki. We start having doubts that this just can't happen because we're only looking for these big things instead of expecting the little things as well, and we start maybe even getting into some disbelief. Yeah, see, we got one person that gets it. Thank you, darling. <laughs> My concern is that we look so hard for the big things, we miss the little things. So Wendy and I do marriage counseling. Don't worry if any of you in here have ever come to us for marriage counseling. You're not about to get outed, okay? But often when people come to us, they come to us because they've got a big problem. He says he doesn't love me anymore. She says she doesn't love me anymore. He did this. They're big problems. And the first thing I want to find out is what were the thousand little things that built up to the big problem? And I think that's our problem with our society. We look for the big things. We look for the big numbers. We do it in church. We do it everywhere. You guys ever heard the term pastor math? Anybody ever heard it? I know Ryan's heard it. You ever been in a church environment where you're like, oh, there's, I'm like I counted there's 82 people here. How many did you have in church today? About 120. <laughs> you had $35 of offering. What was your offering today? Oh, it's it about 150 bucks. My point is, there are churches, and you guys have seen it. If you've been around any pastors, they, they, they make their numbers bigger. How many people gave their life to Christ today? I mean, there must have been a dozen or so. I mean, I only saw three hands, but that's really cool that you saw nine more. I didn't see. I read a statistic one time that in Jamaica, I think there's, don't quote, don't hold me to these numbers, there's like 2 million people in Jamaica, but 5 million people have given their life to Christ. Let's see, there's some really confused people that have given their life to Christ a lot, or there's some pastor math in there. But my point is, we like to make things bigger than they are. It's just our nature. But in, in marriage counseling, I'm looking for what happened day one that was little, and then it happened again day two, and it happened again day three, and over 20 years it built into something big. Because whether it's good or bad, little things build to something big. Okay? So I'm letting the cat out of the bag of the whole sermon. Quit looking for the big things and look for the little things that add up to the big things. Okay? But God's a God of big things. He created in six days. Poof, it's all here. It's not the Big Bang Theory. It's the God Theory. He created everything. Everything. What's that? Right. He created everything. It was big. Then when evil was happening, he went with a big flood. Parted the Red Sea. Those are big things, right? So we read these stories and we get lulled into thinking and God's this big thing, and he is, and that's all we should expect. What about 2 Kings? There's a story that sticks out to me in 2 Kings where the Israelite army is about to go up against the Assyrians. I think it is. And the angel of the Lord goes before him and strikes down 185,000 soldiers before they even have to fight. That's big, right? 3,000 were added on the day of Pentecost. That's big. Jesus fed 5,000. That's big. Bigger than 5,000. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That was big. Jesus cast out over 2,000 demons from one person into pigs. That's big, right? But God's also the God of little things. Luke 16, 10 says, If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. It's a simple verse. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. I remember going to work for a church, and I was tasked with a job that I hated. I hated it. I couldn't stand this one particular thing I had to do out of the 47 other things I had to do. 
And every time I sat and stared at the computer screen and said, I don't want to do this, I had this verse pop in my mind. You better be faithful with what I'm giving you that's little. Because it seemed like this little bitty thing that was totally insignificant. But God told me, you better be faithful in this one little thing if you're ever, if I'm ever going to trust you to be faithful in something big. So we talked a couple weeks ago about a mustard seed, right? Jesus didn't say have the faith of a mountain, did he? Did he say that? He said have the faith of one of the smallest things that exist on earth. Have the faith the size of a mustard seed and you will move mountains. Yeah, Parker's reminding us. Remember I had a picture of a mustard seed. It was a little bitty in a guy's finger. And then a picture of this giant tree that evolves out of that mustard seed. So he's talking about have the type of faith that will grow into something big, okay? So I think about the American church. And I think about people that come through here for weddings or if I'm out in public, and I say, we have a church at our building. And the first question they ask is, how many people you're running on Sunday? And I go, I don't know. I don't count them. <laughs> what? But they don't even care. They just go ahead and tell me how many they're running through on Sunday. It's all about numbers, right? Running through. (laughs) But we get wrapped up. My concern is we get wrapped up in these big numbers. We get wrapped up in the big miracles, the big offerings, the big stories. And every one of those is good, but Jesus is saying you might have it in the wrong order. you got to be thankful and get wrapped up in the little things. And then you'll earn the right for the big things. You ever heard the saying... You miss the forest for the trees. Anybody ever heard that saying? Have you ever not heard that saying? Oh, man, we got some people who have not heard it, so I need to explain it. So if if somebody says you're missing the forest for the trees, what they're saying is it's right in front of you. You don't even see it. It's right in front of you. You're missing the forest for the trees. You're missing what's right in front of you because you're looking for the wrong thing. Does that make sense now for those that haven't heard that? And I think we can apply that to God. I think we can apply that to the kingdom of God. If we get the wrong order, we're looking for the big things first, we're going to miss the little things, right? I'm looking for the big things, I'm looking for the big things, I'm looking for the big things, but I miss the importance of the little thing. I miss the importance of the little girl giving her life to Christ and making a life-changing decision at a very young age because I wanted 40 to do it, right? Right? I miss the forest for the trees. So we got to be careful that we're not looking so much at big things that we miss little things. They're happening around us every day, every hour. And we don't want to take them for granted. Because I believe in my life, God is saying, I'm not going to trust you with big things until you show that you're going to do the little things right. Man, I, I can't, I know person after person after person after person. They get on fire for God, and the first thing they're looking for is, where's my platform? Where's my platform? I just went through drug rehab. I I made it through it. I'm clean. Why can't I preach on Sunday morning? Yeah, you got a message for somebody, but maybe you need to offer to clean the bathrooms first. Maybe you need to offer to come set up tables first. Wiki talked about serving. Maybe you need to offer to come do something little that no one sees that you're not going to get a pat on the back for so God can trust you with the big stage. Because if he trusts you too quick with the big stage, what's going to happen? Pride. I'm just going to end there with one word, pride. If God had trusted me with the big things first, I think my head would be so big. <laughs> I would think that, I know, don't don't question what I'm doing. God gave me this platform, okay? But no, I need to go clean a bathroom and prove that I will do the thing no one else wants to do. And then maybe God says, okay, now you've dropped your pride and I can give you that platform. I'm concerned that many of us, though, are missing the forest for the trees every day because we don't take time to look for these small things that are happening right around us, or we don't take time to do the small things that are opportunities. We get wrapped up in these crazy big stories of God's power, and I read this online, and God's doing this here, and there's this revival, and so many people came, and then we do something, and we don't get the same results, and we get dejected. 
But there's a few other scriptures that talk about little things. <laughs> so Jesus fed 5,000, right? But what did he start with? What did he start with? Five loaves and two pieces of, I'm sorry, five loaves and two fish. John 6, 9 says there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that for this huge crowd? So let's set the stage for this. So Jesus is preaching, and it says 5,000 men came. So we don't know how many women and children. Maybe that's where Pastor Matt came from. <laughs> 5,000 men, but it was probably like 20,000 or 30,000. So Jesus says, we got all these people, and Jesus knows the answer, but he's testing the faith of his disciples. And he says, how are we going to feed them? And Andrew responds, well, I mean, this little boy's got five loaves and two fish, but what good is that going to do? And Jesus said, tell everybody to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. So we know the story, right? If you've been in church, you've heard the story before, but did you get the theme? We need a lot. We don't have a lot. We got a little. And what did Jesus do? He gave thanks for the little. There's your design right there. Jesus said, give thanks for the little, and then God turned it into something big. So I want to encourage you guys, quit looking for, the, pray for the big things. Look for the big things, but quit getting wrapped up in that to where we miss the little things happening right in front of us. And when the little things happen, or we have an opportunity to do the little things, thank God for the little thing. I'm going to say it again. We've got to get it in the right order. We need a lot. We got a little. Look for the little. Be thankful for the little. Let God do the big. How about David and Goliath? Anybody ever heard that story? Everybody good? Everybody know that story? So you got this big, huge, trained army shaking because of one big bully. They're paralyzed. They can't do anything. And then you got this little boy that comes along. He's just a shepherd boy, and he's coming to bring his brother's food. He's not coming to fight. He's coming to bring his brother's food. Guess what he was doing? He was doing the little thing God told him to do. You think as a little Jewish boy or whatever he was, you think he wanted to, to go fight? I'm sure he wanted to go fight. Like, my brothers are fighting. Why can't I fight? No, you take care of the shepherd, do, uh, sheep. You do the little thing. But go take food to your brothers. <laughs> I want to go fight with my brothers. I don't know if he said this. I'm just thinking how I would think. God said, go take food to your brother. So he does, and he comes up, and he sees this dude making fun of God. And he's like, you're not going to make fun of my God. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing this story. You're not going to make fun of my God. But he didn't have much. He just had a sling and five stones, right? Goes over, cuts his head off. Okay, boys, here's your lunch. See you all later. He was faithful in the little thing. He was asked to take care of the sheep. He was asked to go feed his brothers. He did what he was asked. Why? Because God had something huge for him. But he had to make sure he was obedient in the little things, right? James 3. I'm just picking a couple of random scriptures here. James is talking about how powerful little things are. And he's talking about our tongue. Your tongue is so powerful. It has the ability to bring life or death. It has the ability to speak blessings or curses. And then he compares it to little things. A bit in a horse's mouth. Anybody ever rode a horse? Have you ever successfully rode a horse? <laughs> Not gotten knocked off. I got a few of these. Okay, what's a horse got in his mouth? So how much does a horse weigh? Anybody know? 800 pounds. I don't know. So you got this... Pastor Matt, thousand pound beast, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so strong, we measure car's power after it. But you put a little bitty piece of metal about yay big in his mouth, and you can steer him everywhere you want to steer him, right? Little thing, 
controls big thousand pound beast. Rudder on a ship. Anybody ever been on a ship? Anybody ever been on a big ship? Still steered by the same little thing, a rudder. It's a little bitty piece of wood in their time or metal or whatever. Little in comparison to the ship is steering the whole ship. Little thing steering big ship. Get the theme? A spark sets a forest fire. Little spark sets a big fire. So the theme here is little things control big things. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather as my followers, I am there among him. He didn't say, Gather up 3,000 like the day of Pentecost and I'll be there. He said, Where two or three are gathered, I'm going to say this, I think Jesus cares as much about you showing up in your home and getting together with your spouse and talking about Jesus as he does about you coming into this building and talking about him. It's easy to gather here with 50, 60, 80, I don't know, there's probably 150 people here, right? (laughs) It's easy to gather here and talk about Jesus, but do you do it at home when two or more are gathered, you and your wife, you and your kids? Be faithful in the little things before you come do it in the big thing, Okay. So I want to challenge you. When's the last time you sat down with your family and talked about the little things God's done for you? When's the last time you sat down and said, hey, let's talk about, let's talk about the things we might miss if we don't sit and intentionally look for these little things that God's done? Because a lot of us that are saying, man, I don't know why God's not moving in my family with these big things I'm asking for. I've asked for a new job, and I've asked for a bigger house, and I've asked for a nicer car, and I've asked for all these big things. I've asked for my children not to be rebellious. I've asked for them to give their life to Jesus. I've asked for all these big things, and I'm not getting anything. And maybe God's saying, you're not gathering with two or more and doing the little thing I need you to do, but you're expecting the big thing. Or maybe it's worse. Don't be the family that sits down only to talk about what's wrong. We need to have a family meeting. Everybody goes, oh, God. What did I do wrong? I had one of those this week. <laughs> I, it was, I came in at the wrong end. They had already had it amongst themselves, and then I came into it late. So I got ganged up on. I deserved it, but I got ganged up on. I'm not saying don't sit down and talk about the things you need to talk about. I'm saying how many times do we are willing to sit down and tell somebody what's wrong with them, what they've done wrong, why they're grounded, what they got to do to earn the Xbox back or whatever, but we don't sit down and talk about, hey, did you notice the other day that this happened and God did something that seemed little, but it was big. But I went to church Sunday. Wasn't that enough? I listened to worship music at church. Wasn't that enough? I went and saw Sean Foy on April 3rd when he came to Knoxville. Isn't that enough? I don't want to beat you up because I know some of you guys are doing this. But if you are doing it, I want you to realize how important it is what you're doing. You're doing a pretty great thing if you sit down with your family daily and talk about how good God is. I stand up here, and I'm very vulnerable and tell you where I fail and where I mess up. But I want to tell you something that was said to me within the last week or so by my son that made me really feel good. He said, we don't talk about anything unless it involves Jesus. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to encourage you. You can't have that. It just takes a little effort. You just got to start and do it. We don't talk about anything without putting a Jesus slant on it. the little things take time to laugh at a little child they're wonderful <laughs> i'm gonna tell you about a story that happened here at the barn last week some of you know the story some of you don't but before we had baptisms last sunday our building got a little baptized on friday some of you heard about this story some of you haven't so this is a week ago this past friday we get up i got a few things i need to kind of button up with the baptistry because i wait till the last minute And then we're going to go out of town because they're surprising me with a night away for my birthday. So it's really nice. We're going to go somewhere. And that morning, Peyton goes, did you hear that weird noise? And I was like, no, I didn't hear a weird noise. And it had quit. And then we're all four in there, and we're about to start getting ready to go do our thing, get out of here. And we hear that noise come back. And Peyton's like, that's the noise. 
And so we go towards the noise. Well, for those that don't know, we're on well water here. And sitting back here behind this wall in a closet is a well bladder. And it's where the well maintains pressure to put water out to the sinks or shower or whatever. Well, apparently this thing has a little pressure regulator on it, so when it drops below a certain pressure, the pump turns on and builds it back up. And when it gets to a certain point, it kicks off. Well, our little pressure regulator broke. And so it just kept building pressure and building pressure and building pressure. So I want you to think about the old-timey, some of you guys aren't going to get this reference, but the old-timey pots you put on a stove and you boil water and you know when the water's ready, why? Because you hear the a little lightheaded <laughs> but you hear the tea kettle go okay think about that that noise on steroids and so I follow the noise I mean it's kind of a freaky noise I follow the noise and I get back here and by the time I get back there there's water coming out from under the door doors locked because we don't want kids in there playing around the well bladder so I take off for a sprint probably should show that video too John <laughs> I take off for a sprint to get my keys, get back, open the door, shut the breaker off for the well pump. How long did that take? I'm not the fastest guy, but no more than a minute. And this entire room, there's a room behind here, if you haven't been there, it runs the entire length of this, was flooded. The closet was flooded. Water was coming through right here. It happened in about a minute. We had a few frantic moments of getting up all of Peyton's couple thousand dollars of music equipment that was in the closet right behind the fireplace here that was all getting wet we grab mops we grab shop vac we start getting up water that's exactly how I felt when I was doing it <laughs> but when it was over our first thoughts were God thank you that we were here man that could have been bad if we if it had happened two hours later this whole building would have flooded, and everything we have would have ruined. Oh, you got insurance for that. Yeah, but it would have been a pain. God, thank you. Thank you that we were here. God, thank you that nothing was damaged. We just started going through little things. God, thank you that none of Peyton's equipment was damaged. Yes, we got insurance, but thank you that none of that musical stuff was damaged. God, thank you that we have concrete floors instead of carpet. You guys ever seen carpet flood? If you don't have to rip it up, what's it look like for the rest of its life? Kind of rippled, right? I thanked God that there was a man that lives right down the road that within two hours showed up and fixed our pump. I'm getting there. So he shows up and he goes, this never happens. Yeah, we're used to that. <laughs> I don't even know where to start to tell you, buddy, how all those things happen to us. <laughs> and he said, man, this is a rare part. I don't even know where I'll get it. I might have one in my house. I thank God that he returned like, what, 15 minutes later, he had one in his house. He had a rare part in his house. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And to get to Wendy's point, I thank God he didn't charge us a dime. He came here, he fixed it, he left, and he didn't charge us. So, so here's what happened. This thing overpressurizes, starts letting out the pressure relief, floods our building really fast. But a guy comes and fixes this with a rare part, doesn't charge us, nothing gets damaged. We got concrete floors that what we couldn't mop up soaked it all in. And I thank God. Right? See, God didn't give me a bigger building, but he sure did save my little building. Little thing, big deal. God didn't give me a million dollars last week, but he saved me a couple hundred dollars by getting a free repair. And I wonder, we can go a lot of places with this, but I wonder, did God allow this to happen to see how we'd respond? Will we respond to the little thing of saying, thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Now, did I turn that breaker off even after he fixed it to go out of town that night? You're absolutely right. I'm going to call that wisdom. <laughs> but it would be easy to get anxious and fearful, maybe angry. 
God, look what we're trying to do for you, and why did you let this happen? No, we said thank you. It would be easy to go out there and get in our camper that we can't keep warm and say, I wonder if that thing's breaking loose again in the middle of the night. No, we thanked him. Be thankful for the little things and trust God. I'm going to give you another little story. We're storytelling this morning. Wendy had surgery last year. We got it all approved through insurance. It took us like two years to get all this stuff sort of lined up with insurance. It was a pain in the rear for insurance. Got it approved. The whole reason it wasn't done sooner is because of insurance, really. Get it approved. And a couple weeks ago, I got a bill from the hospital for $50,000. And then right after that, I got a letter from the insurance that said, we're denying your surgery because it was a pre-existing condition. <laughs> so many questions. I thought Obamacare took care of all that was first one. <laughs> Second one is I thought we got it approved. So we start making phone calls. You guys ever call your insurance company or the doctor? Holy moly. Okay, so I sat on it for a couple weeks because I was dreading these conversations and what are we going to do? But I started thanking God. God, thank you we were able to have the surgery. Thank you that she's not hurting anymore. Thank you she made it through it. But I still had this $50,000 debt out there. So I finally get around. I, I get the men in the men's group to pray. Guys, will you pray for us? Like, this is big. The next, like, Tuesday, or that was Tuesday. The next day after I asked the guys to pray, the next day I call the insurance company, and they go, we didn't deny your claim. I got a letter that I got their phone number off to call that says, we denied your claim. And I called them, and they said, we didn't deny your claim. But... We're not going to pay everything the hospital is charging. I was like, okay, I'm scratching my head again. She had surgery. It was supposed to go this way. The doctor screwed up, so it went this way. Now i got to pay the difference? Probably not going to win that battle. So I've never been so happy to hear the words, you only owe $15,000. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That was my first response. So then I called the hospital, and I'm like, I got this nasty note from you that says I owe you $50,000. And you're going to turn it over to collections if we don't pay this soon. And I really don't want that on our credit. Um, but the insurance says that it, they're going to pay some of it, but they're arguing with you. And she goes, honey, I can't even find this in our system. And I'm going, God, are you really about to do this? <laughs> and she searches and she searches and she, and this goes on. I, we, she hung up on me. I had to call back, wait again. This goes on for a long time. And when I finally get, she finally figures it out. It had been pushed over to this collection thing, but then it had been pulled back into a different department because they were still negotiating with insurance. How does that happen? How does that happen unless God did something? But see, I could have got wrapped up in, come on, God, where am I going to come up with this money? Come on, Lord, why are you doing this? But I didn't. I said, thank you, God. Thank you that we'll figure it out. I don't know how we'll figure it out. I don't know where we are yet. God hasn't erased the whole debt. We don't know where we are, but maybe he wanted to see how we would react to a piece of it moving. My point is, guys, how many little things are happening around you all the time, but you don't think they're big enough? I choose to think they're big enough. What if I had to pay $50,000? It's a miracle my wife's fine. i pay a million dollars for that. Oh. <laughs> I could get wrapped up in what's not happening and I miss the big thing that she's healed Jesus said take the little thing be thankful for it and watch what God can do with it maybe it's physical like a fish, bread or maybe it's your faith God showed me something this week that sparked this whole thing there was a little thing that he sparked, and, and, and I hope you'll get it as important as I did. But there's so many of us that we're looking for something big to happen. I'm looking for the fire of God to take over this country. I'm looking for the fire of God to take over our community. I'm looking for this big revival. I'm looking for people to fall out. I'm looking for miracles and healing. And God's saying, I'm looking for that fire in you. 
is that fire in you? No, because I'm waiting on the environment to give me the fire. And God said, you get the fire in you, and then I'll give you the environment. You've got to trust in the little thing before I give you the big thing. The fire has to be in you before it's going to happen around you. Okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. God's saying, I'll take that fire that's burning in you and we'll ignite new fires. It'll be the spark. But don't come into me asking me for the big environment to get you there. So I started this morning with questions about big things. So I'm going to end this morning with giving you examples of little things. This week, I watched, in the past week, I've watched two people give incredible and vulnerable testimonies before they got baptized. And all they talked about was how Jesus Christ has changed them, renewed them. Different circumstances, different life circumstances, doesn't matter. Jesus renewed them. And I'm going to tell you right now, those two testimonies fire me up as much as hearing that a worldwide worldwide revival are happening. I thank God for those two testimonies. How's he going to give us more if we don't thank him for the little ones? And they're huge ones, by the way. They're not little things. Those are big ones. Over the past few weeks, we started something new where we do a little pre-service worship thing. And I've watched people soak in the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room. I've watched a peace come over them that they didn't come in here with. I've watched tears flow, some of my own. And I'm going to tell you right now, that fires me up just as much as seeing somebody laid out in the Spirit. I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that fires me up because I I want them to experience peace. I want them to have the little thing. Over the last week, I watched a video of the college ministry. So I don't know exactly how many people, but I think it was about seven people went out. So it all started in Mandy's second story, the name of the ministry. (laughs) And somebody challenging them. We can't just talk about it in this room. We got to get out and do it. So they jump in a car and they go to Kroger and they pray over a policeman. That fires me up. Because they didn't just talk about it. They got out and did something. And it doesn't matter who sparked it, who said, let's get in the car. They went and did something. Then I got to see a video of them standing outside where the ambulances are over here on Washington. Thank you. And they're singing. They're just with a guitar and singing over the EMTs, over the people that are going out and seeing trauma. And I'm going to tell you right now, watching that video got me just as fired up as being in Washington, D.C. with 50,000 people on a national mall. In fact, it got me more fired up because I saw the genuineness and trueness of that versus in Washington, no matter how good the person's heart is, when you get 50,000 people together, they stop looking at Jesus and start looking at the man, and we saw it. Here's another little thing. I sat in this room the other night while youth was going on, and I heard a voice of a young boy singing to the top of his lungs I've never heard before, your son, Daniel. He was singing to the top of his lungs. That fired me up as much as watching 50,000 people sing to Jesus. My 15-year-old son gets up here and leads. I don't know, what are we, like 200 people here? (laughs) 375? Okay, thank you. (laughs) Easy. (laughs) Don't go there. It fires me up to hear my son lead you in worship. It fires me up as much as if I sat at Hillsong amongst how many thousand people while they're producing records. Why? Because his heart is pure. Because at 9 p.m. last night, when most of y'all were eating your bonbons and getting ready to go to bed, he was sitting in there praying, saying, God, is this the three songs? That fires me up. Young girl, got some swelling in her back. I'm picking on your family today. Young girl's got some swelling in her back. She can't play basketball, right? She gets prayed over. She gets some inner healing to heal some emotional and spiritual wounds. Two days later, what's she doing? Playing basketball again. Why? Why does that fire me up? Because there's a physical healing, but there's also an emotional and a spiritual healing that's going to do really good things for her in the future. That fires me up. Fires me up as much as seeing a dead person brought back to life. 
I still want to see that. <laughs> I still want the big thing, but I'm going to be thankful to God in the little thing. When I watch one person walk into this church that we meet at a wedding or that we meet while out in our community, it fires me up as, seeing, as much as seeing a new building being built to house thousands. This one is going to hurt some of y'all. Get ready. This one's going to hurt a little bit. When I watch, how old's Daniel? When I watch an 11-year-old boy give $10.51 in an envelope that says, my tithe. Woo! If that don't fire you up. Or when I watch another 10-year-old boy named Parker give his $25 Amazon gift card he got for Christmas to tithing. Or a portion of it. I can't really remember. $75 gift card. He spent 50 of it and gave 25 Man. That should get you fired up. Because Jesus talked about the woman that had nothing, but she gave what she had. And he said it's better than some rich person giving all that they have. Don't get me wrong. I want the $100,000 check that somebody's going to bring here one day. I'm going to keep asking. But I'm going to get just as fired up over two 10, 11-year-old boys giving a combination of $30 and some odd cents. Okay? Because they're getting it. They're getting it at a very young age. There's terms out there like you can't outgive God. There's scripture in Luke about pressed over, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember it all. The point is they're getting it at a young age. So what's my whole point, the whole theme? There are miracles going on around us. There's growth happening all around you. But have you missed the forest for the trees? What about that waitress you're going to see later today? How many of you can go out to eat after church? Okay, a few of you. What about that waitress or waiter that walks up and you can see the pain in their eyes? What about that moment when you say, Jesus loves you? Have a good day. I didn't say you led them to Christ. I didn't say you sat and witnessed to them for four hours and kept them from doing their job. I said a little thing. I think we have these little opportunities in front of us daily. And sometimes we walk right by them because it's not the big thing. So I'm asking you to do two things. I'm asking you to pay attention and brag and thank God. Brag about God and thank God for the little things happening. Look for the little things. But don't miss the opportunity for the little things. Maybe when God puts your friend on your heart and you call them and you say, I just want to encourage you and tell you I love you today. And then you get that text back that says, you don't know how much I needed this today. That should get you fired up. So the challenge this week, look for the little, thank God for it, and I want you to look for little things that you can do. So Father, I thank you that your word shows us over and over and over again that you do do big things, but you do little things. And just like something bad, a little thing can pile onto a little thing, can pile onto a little thing and create this snowball of bad, it can be the same with good. So, Father, I'm asking that you help show us, make us realize the little things you're doing in our lives every day. God, I thank you this morning that a little girl changed her eternity. And that her parents now get to walk her through her childhood of knowing Jesus. And that we get to walk with them to help empower them. That's a miracle. I didn't see a person get raised from the dead today, but I saw a person get eternal life today, and that's pretty cool. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, help us to do the little things. Help us to take that moment and get out of our selfishness and get out of our hurry and stop and love on someone. And help us to realize it can be little. It doesn't have to be big. You'll take the little, and you'll make it big, Father. And I thank you for the examples you give us in Jesus' name. Amen.